There is a word that is Ubuntu. <laughs> a word that captures the essence of human relationships. Ubuntu means that we are all united. way that is invisible to the eyes, meaning we are all allies. It's trusting and collaborating, supporting and sharing our essence. Lots of small people in small places doing small things can change the world. Welcome back to Epidemics TV. This is the chapter episode 24. Thank you very much for being with us one day more. And today, today it's a very special day. We're going to talk about the Western Hemisphere, especially about the United States of America and Brazil, the most touched countries. No, the, the virus has been hitting these two countries massively in the last weeks. And we want to share with wonderful speakers uh, why, why this is happening, what are the main reasons, what is the current situation, and what we can expect in the next day. But before going into all that, remember to be protecting yourself. Let's launch this video to remain, remain that. Today we have great speakers and I would like to introduce you the first two speakers uh, that are going to talk about the United States of America. With us, Rafael Grossman, he's a well-known uh, doctor, um, uh, very well-known in the digital health space community and he's talking from Maine, United States, and he's going to talk about the, the current situation and, and what can innovation uh, how innovation can help in this process. Uh, but before that, let's launch a video of Rafael. Listen to that. If someone tells you that wearing a mask is going to make you sick from lack of oxygen or from poisoning from CO2, don't believe that. Be wise. Today, we have the responsibility as individuals, as members of a society, not to get others sick, not to get ourselves sick. As a surgeon, I wear a mask many hours a day, and I've proven to you by this video that oxygen levels are not diminished. Just be safe, just be smart, wear a mask. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you for repeating again in Epidemics TV. You are always very educational. Um, Rafael, what is the current situation in your state and, and what do you think of how innovation uh, can really help in these uh, following months? Thank you for joining Hi, us. Uh, George. Hi, Jordi and team. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's an it's honor to, to be here. Listen, I'm from, you know, so I'm Hispanic, I'm Latino. And um, I, uh, I, I, I maybe see things uh, a little bit from a, from a different perspective, maybe. Uh, the, the situation in Maine, where I live, uh, I've been here for 16 years working as a, as a general and, and trauma surgeon. And uh, uh, this is the whitest uh, state in the United States. Uh, so uh, maybe because of that, or, or because we're very isolated in a way and somewhat remote, and uh, we have a very number of people, you know, 1.2 million people in the whole state, and the state is larger than Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire all together. 
Uh, so it's a pretty good area. So the cases are very few. The important thing is not the bulk numbers. The important thing is uh, that the numbers are rising. They don't stop. People say that we are up to our knees in the first wave of uh, COVID-19. I think that that's wrong. I think that we're up to our chest uh, and we haven't finished the first wave. And in our state, uh, what we see is a reflection of what happens in other states and uh, neighbor states, even in New England, you know, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, Connecticut. Uh, the numbers are uh, striking. And as you know, all, and I don't, going to, to specific details of numbers, they change by the minute, right? Uh, we have surpassed uh, 3 million cases uh, all over the world. Uh, the U.S. has uh, a good uh, share of those uh, 3 million cases. Uh, we have a good share of deaths. Uh, I think we hit a, 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 a number of, of 100,000 plus deaths in, 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 in just a few days ago. So it's, it's a very dire situation. What I want to touch a little bit about is uh, on how the, uh, uh, the inequality, uh, the racial disparities uh, are really striking. And as you all know, uh, healthcare in general is very despair. Uh, we have uh, a, a inequality in healthcare as we have in many other areas. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, for example, in, in, in African Americans, uh, uh, heart disease, uh, hypertension, uh, renal disease, diabetes, obesity are much higher than in non African American uh, populations. Uh, we have uh, finally some data that uh, uh, can support. Uh, claims in relation to uh, coronavirus, you know, COVID-19, and uh, race or ethnicity. About 48 uh, states, I think, have uh, reported uh, some uh, race or ethnicity details in relation to COVID-19. So we're making progress. And, you know, data is everything. We cannot beat any disease, but especially we cannot beat this pandemic. We cannot beat COVID-19 without data, and we are getting slowly the data, and the data is staggering. Uh, if you are a, a non-Hispanic, a, 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 a non-white, the uh, if you're a, a, a black or African-American, or if you're an, 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 a non-Hispanic native uh, Indian or Alaskan population, uh, the the numbers are, are incredible. You know, five times more chance of uh, getting the disease, uh, of uh, being hospitalized, uh, uh, five more uh, times uh, uh, the number of deaths uh, than if you're a, a, a white, a non-Hispanic white. And that is along with the fact that the diseases that I mentioned before go along. And we all know that COVID-19 hits harder and the morbidity and the mortality is worse in people who have all those comorbidities. So it is, you know, a very intuitive to then conclude that a, a ethnic groups a, a in minorities are going to be hit harder. And that is a problem. And I think that COVID-19 is almost like a shining light in what healthcare is, is finally letting us know that uh, all those uh, inequalities and disparities that we knew existed now are uh, obvious to everyone because you are getting the virus, you're being hospitalized, and you're dying from this uh, horrible, horrible disease. So we have a means to improve on that uh, significantly. And uh, we've talked about innovation, we've talked about, you know, a, tracing, we're talking about uh, telemedicine. We have been chatting about this for several weeks now. The thing is that all those uh, marvelous, uh, futuristic in a way, technological advances are not available to all those ethnic minorities, to all those other you know, a, a groups that are somewhat always, somewhat always underserved. You know, broadband access, for example, you know, who, who, how can you connect to your doctor if you don't have cellular service or if you don't have internet at home, if you don't have a computer, if you don't have electricity. Uh, think not just in the U.S., but in the world. I was talking to my family in Venezuela yesterday. We couldn't even do a FaceTime because first they didn't have electricity. And then when we did, they didn't have broadband uh, to connect in video. So how can you... Uh, address uh, such a terrible problem without the uh, technological advances that a very few, you know, in the world, a very small portion of the world takes for granted. So that is my sort of my, my, my quest and my, my message today, along with the fact that simple things like social distancing and masking do help.
need to all of us in the in the healthcare uh, workers in the healthcare providing uh, sector we need to be not just treating patients but we need to be uh, beacons of of education of uh, training of advice of uh, uh, you know almost almost a, a, a reprimanding you know people uh, for not doing things that are easy if there was a pill that has the effect of masks and social distancing we would all be taking that pill. It's up to us not just to wear the mask, but to also share uh, that important message to people who is not in the healthcare uh, world, people who are maybe willing to listen to us and maybe try to make them understand why this is so important, because that's the only way that we're going to beat this disease. Uh, we talk about a, a, a tracking, we talk about uh, tracing, we talk uh, about testing, we talk about treatment, uh, you know, the four T's. It is, but it's up to us. We have the responsibility as healthcare providers to bring that message out there. Rafael, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you think that innovation, precisely in these last words that you mentioned, no tracking, um, uh, information, uh, technology fighting against fake news, do you think that uh, telemedicine, we knew that at the beginning during the, the first, um, the the first outbreak, so the big pandemic at the beginning in March, April, it seemed that people kept be kept at home, well at home. But do you think that after telemedicine was massively implemented, uh, do you think that that will be here forever to stay and that that will improve uh, our lives? Telemedicine, you mean? Yes, tele digital innovation yeah. in general, no? Absolutely. I think that the mistake is to see uh, telehealth or telemedicine or digital medicine uh, as a patch, you know, in this uh, pandemic. It's not a patch. This pandemic has shown a light in what uh, the technology can do. We had the idea already for decades, right, about telemedicine, and we couldn't approach uh, telemedicine uh, in a right way from the regulatory point of view, from the practical point of view, from the reimbursement point of view. And then what happened that in a few days of the COVID-19 uh, 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 cases, we realized that there was no way to, to do it otherwise. There was no way they could come to the office and be seen. It had to be by video. So suddenly these obstacles and hurdles that telemedicine and telehealth had disappeared, you know, completely in the air, right? So uh, I think that uh, we need to continue that. And I'm pretty sure it's going to continue because we cannot sustain healthcare uh, the way it was before this pandemic. Uh, I think that uh, telehealth, telemedicine, digital medicine has to be a pillar of healthcare, just like Patients, like community, uh, like uh, providers, uh, it has to be one of the pillars of the healthcare system. Telemedicine is just medicine. Telehealth is just healthcare. It's just another way to communicate. It's a better way to communicate. You could send a fax or write a love letter. You could write, you know, you can call by landline or you can use a cell phone or you could use video. There are many ways to connect and communicate with patients. And we know that healthcare's problems are most of the time related to poor lack of connectivity and communication. It's not a substitute, Thanks. it's another addition to the armamentarium of the healthcare providers. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you very much. We will discuss later in the debate, as always. So we proceed now with uh, Dr. Pietro Aparicio. Uh, Dr. Pietro Aparicio is the president of the Latinos Caucus of Public Health in the United States. Pietro, Welcome Hi. for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We would like much. to please uh, explain us a little bit uh, how do you see the situation as Rafa was pointing out the different minorities and this overall overview of what is happening in your state and also but also all, all in the United States. Sure, great. Well, thank you, Rafael. I think that was a great set way for my presentation, so I appreciate that. Um, so I have a few slides some, that might be helpful to kind of follow up on some of the points that I'd like to make today. Um, if you um, wouldn't mind uh, to move to the next slide. Great. All right, so thank you again. Really appreciate the invitation. Um, so today, um, I'm, I'm pleased to share uh, with you a public health perspective 
which is a little bit different. Uh, this is regarding the uh, coronavirus pandemic and the impact in the United States and particularly in New York City where I live. Uh, in this presentation, I'll try to keep it short, we'll talk about data, social disparities, and social determinants of health. Now, the rates of coronavirus cases, uh, we're going to discuss it today a bit, uh, hospitalizations and deaths. And we're also uh, going to talk about the different ethnic groups in the, in the U.S., uh, which, you know, each one of them have a different makeup. And that will help us kind of give us an idea or understand why the rates are different in each of these uh, ethnic groups. Now, uh, as you heard, uh, Rafael, um, it's, it's, you know, it has to do with uh, uh, social disparities and what we're going to talk about, social determinants of health. But all this is not straightforward. Um, these are multi multifactorial reasons, so it's a little bit more complex, uh, you know, than to the naked eye. So the purpose of my presentation um, will be mostly to provide some data points and promote the discussion that is going on. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, answers uh, today, but, but, but I do have some specific data points that will be important you know, to discuss. Uh, just very quickly, we have heard about the social determinant of health. Uh, which, you know, these are very important because they really impact directly on the health status of the individual and the community. And these uh, um, items are actually interconnected and a combination of them really have a synergistic effect. Uh, we talked about health and health care, uh, social and community context, education, economic stability, neighborhood and built environment. On the next slide, uh, this is a slide of the United States. So you can see uh, the numbers here. This is data from yesterday. This is data from CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control uh, and Prevention. So the data is updated uh, daily. Uh, the data comes through the surveillance system uh, from the public health department all over the United States. And the data is broken down by states and counties uh, just to have more specific information on specific areas. Uh, now, U.S., as you know, continues to be um, one of the countries that had the highest rate of infection. Uh, and we have seen, as Rafael mentioned, um, some uh, new outbreaks in Florida, California, Texas, Arizona, and other states. Now, talking about you, uh, New York City, um, you can see the data here. Uh, fortunately for New York, uh, the, day, the numbers have gone down. Uh, we have about, uh, about less than 100 a day and sometimes no death. But a, a few weeks ago, uh, New York had about 6,000 cases daily and about 700, 800 deaths a day. And so, uh, so the, uh, New York City managed to get those numbers down and to keep it down uh, lately. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't see th uh, that in other states where the cases were uh, kind of going down, but now we have seen another, uh, again, that those cases are, are going up, and there's a lot of conversation and discussion about that. Uh, on the next slide, um, this is uh, just to give you a little bit of background and have a sense, you know, where we are at in terms of population. These are the population in the United States. Uh, 60, about 60% 60 of the population is white. Um, and following uh, by the Latino population, we are about 18% of the population. And after that, uh, the African Americans, about 13% of the population. There are smaller groups uh, that include Asians, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, uh, native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. Uh, but uh, this is just to give you an example how uh, the majority of the population is white. Uh, it's true, you know, the Latinos are 80% undergrowing. This is like data for 2016. Uh, interesting also, there also this data uh, show projections, uh, which in the uh, in 2016, uh, the population, the Latino population, it's uh, going to grow. Uh, 
And the same as the African, uh, the same of African American, the other population, and it's going to be a decrease of the white population as projection. So that would also kind of change also how you know how we provide health. Uh, on the next slide, this is uh, um, data actually from the New York Times um, from the late um, May. Around that time, there was an outcry because. Uh, uh, health providers were noticing that many of the patients who were positive for COVID-19 were Latinos and they were Black uh, African Americans, but there was no actually data to uh, you know to sustain that, um, and it actually took the New York Times to file uh, what we call a Freedom of Information Act suit uh, and made the CDC uh, to make that information public. At that time, um, CDC provided information of about 1.45 million cases. And when they look at the data, they found that a, a good percentage of those cases did not have information or data on ethnicity. And there was not information on uh, home county or address, <clears throat> which you know, it was quite significant. So that obviously, it was all over the news. Uh, Minority groups were, you know, up in arms. Why the what, that data was not collected? Why the data was not available? So after that, it became man, uh, mandated for all health providers and facilities to collect and uh, and provide that data, make it public in terms of ethnicity. So uh, with this data that was provided by the New York Times, uh, they found that Latinos and African Americans are three times more likely to become infected than their uh, white neighbors. And Latinos between the ages of 40 to 50 years old um, were five times, uh, have a higher rate of infections than uh, white on the same uh, age group, which is quite interesting. Uh, on the next slide, um, this is uh, uh, information, uh, the next slide, if you don't mind. Information on hospitalizations. Um, so as you can see on the numbers, uh, American Indians, Alaska Natives, uh, African Americans had a rate approximately five times that of white persons to be hospitalized because of COVID-19. Hispanics um, or Latinos had a rate approximately four times that of white people. Black and Latinos uh, had nearly twice likely to die from the virus than, than white. And uh, another piece of information, but it's not here in the day on this graph, is that Latinos who die, more than a quarter were younger than 60, you know, compared to uh, white people who died only 6% were uh, in that, uh, were that young. And again, I'm just providing data point for discussion. Uh, and, and, and as you probably see later, uh, all this is not kind of straightforward, but we can make uh, straightforward conclusions. Um, on the next slide, um, this is data from New York City. As you see, uh, New York City, if you're not familiar with New York City, New York City is uh, composed of five boroughs. Um, one is the Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Uh, as you see on the data, uh, African Americans and Latinos have a higher rate of cases, hospitalizations, and death uh, compared with the white population. Now, it's, it's interesting to know that when you look at African Americans and Latino, the in New York City, based on this data, uh, African Americans have a higher rate of cases, a higher rate of hospitalizations. Uh, but when you look at death, Latinos uh, have a higher rate of death. So not everything is a straightforward uh, when it comes to health outcomes, uh, as you can see. That, um, the next uh, item or the next slide, uh, if you can change it, just to give you a little bit of, you know, more uh, data point uh, regarding minorities. Uh, this is a slide that describes other chronic diseases this in the African-American population. And they um, look at high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke. And they saw that the risk uh, of these chronic diseases were higher uh, 
for black uh, in comparison to uh, you know the white neighbors at every uh, age bracket. And they also uh, were able to pull out for this information that uh, mortality rate is also higher um, in black uh, in comparison with white. Now this pattern is very similar to what we are observing in COVID-19. On this next slide, since we, we're talking about uh, social determinant of health, so this is again data points, you know, for your information. Um, the one on top, the left top, um, this is uh, measures education. You see, uh, this is 25 year old people uh, who have a, a bachelor degree. Um, and in the United States, a bachelor degree is it's a, it's a, it's a university degree. I know in other countries it's a bit different. So we noticed the Asians and white have a higher education, you can say, uh, followed with African-Americans um, and, and uh, Latinos. So Latinos, based on this graph, have the lower uh, education rate. Health insurance, uh, you all know works very different in the United States. Uh, you must have a health, health insurance in the United States, otherwise you'd really be in trouble. We don't have a universal care. Um, whites, again, have the highest rate of health insurance. Uh, African-Americans and Latinos, Latinos especially, have a lower rate of health insurance. Uh, and the other graph, um, it's uh, regarding income. Again, Asians and, uh, and white have a higher income. Uh, African Americans and Latinos have a lower income. But it's interesting to notice that uh, Latinos, uh, based on this graph, have a higher income than African, than African Americans. So even though Latinos, based on this information, uh, have a higher income, they have a, a lower rate of health insurance and a lower uh, rate in terms of education, even though they have a higher income. Um, so, as you can tell, uh, things are not really straightforward and requires, you know, but that we look more closely into these uh, groups and, and data. Zip code. Uh, there are a lot of studies and in the United States uh, with zip code. Zip code, it really uh, uh, says what neighborhood uh, you live in. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies comparing zip codes and wealth on those neighborhoods. Great. Uh, very quickly. And this is my last slide. Uh, <clears throat> so the hypothesis we've been working with is that Latinos and African Americans have a higher rate of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths due to access to healthcare services, income level, education, poor housing, uh, lack of access to exercise, nutritional food, and, you know, and their neighborhoods are in a safe environment. But there are actually difference between minorities. So this, uh, you know, what we see on these indicators that are not really straightforward. So more is needed to really understand what's going on. We need to consider uh, factors like legal status, language barriers, behaviors and practices. You know, they are more frequently or specific to some uh, communities. Family values, the family dynamics, you know, practices about healing, home medicine, and among others. So there's among other factors that we need to consider. And we cannot forget that many of those factors are also out of the control of this minority group, such as um, national state policies, economy, you know, has its ups and downs, and politics. In the United States, uh, I emphasize the black community and the Latino community, but the United States also has some that minorities like Asians, Native Alaskans, um, American Indians, and they also required to be looked at, you know, very careful through a different lens and consider a specific um, uh, specific factors that are, uh, uh, you know, unique to this um, community. So again, um, this is data points, you know, that I'm providing. I'm not bringing solutions. It's just more, you know, food uh, for the, for discussion. Uh, and just to emphasize that this is a multifactorial factors, uh, and you know, there's not really straightforward answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pietro. Uh, do you really believe that the situation is getting worse and worse in the, in the last days, and that the um, base evidence uh, facts are put behind uh, politics and economy? 
Uh, well, yeah, you cannot separate, you know, health services with what's going with the economy and politics. Uh, as I mentioned, they do they do impact, you know, the health um, health outcomes. Um, I can tell that in New York, in terms of cases, uh, the numbers have significantly got down. Uh, and uh, um, and the um, governor Cuomo has, a, you know, a lot to do with that. He has kind of put out kind of tough hand in, in, New, in New York City. Um, but that's, uh, you know, my opinion. Um, uh, uh, but again, in, in other states where there have been an, a new increase, uh, it's where some of the regulations have been, been more uh, flexible, more loose, uh, and we have seen a decrease. So, you know, everybody's really struggling all over, all over the United States uh, what to do because their pressures, uh, you know, we, you know, we definitely don't want to have a, a higher rate of cases or hospitalizations of death. And there are also pressures from the economy, pressures from the uh, politicians. So, uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's, it's very complex. And there's a lot of stakeholders in these uh, conversations. Um, you know, every member of the community, every, you know, um, um, every institution really has, uh, has a say in here and, and has a, a role that it's, it's quite important. No, thank you. Thank you very much for setting the food for discussion later, Rafael and Pietro about uh, America, United States of America. States of America. And now, for, and now for, we go from there to the big other, the big giant in the South, Brazil. Um, we would like to set the tone, uh, starting with uh, a video, a video about uh, an indigenous community that, of course, is not representing whole Brazil, but let's change the tide and let's go to the uh, south hemisphere let's go to the um, video please A gente tem tratado todos os sintomas que a gente tem sentido aqui com os próprios remédios caseiros que a gente, desde os nossos antepassados, vieram passando e cada um com um pouco de conhecimento foi juntando os remédios e fomos experimentando, fomos usando para que cada remédio combatesse um sintoma da doença. xarope caseiro, que ajudou muito a aliviar, porque eu fiquei com um pouco de cansaço também. Me dava falta de ar, pra, ia prendendo meu, meu pulmão, sei lá, meu falta de ar e eu tomei o xarope. que eles escolhem quem atender e, e deixam a gente ah, sem atenção. Né? A gente tem aprendido a se virar, a tem aprendido a lutar sozinho. genocídio e quero denunciar essa coisa ao mundo inteiro, ao mundo inteiro. Nós temos aqui um governo que não liga para a vida dos índios. É um crime, que eu diria um crime contra a humanidade, isso que está sendo praticado aqui no meu estado, aqui na minha região.
Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, Brazil is a big, it's a big continent itself, and their opinions for from from different points of views. We're going we're not going to enter, as you know, in epidemics in any big political discussions. But Brazil is living a situation, um, yeah, a very important situation. That's why we have invited three different speakers from, from Manaus in the north, uh, from Sao Paulo, Priscilla, and, and from the south is uh, Israel Molina from Minas Gerais. Uh, we're gonna talk with Jaila Diaz Borges, with Priscilla Cruzati and Israel Molina. And with us, as always, Juan Antonio Burgos, that will lead the moderation from now onwards um, with the Brazilian counterparts. Thank you, Juan. Thank you so very much to Jose and to Rafael. They were very, very interesting presentations, putting into perspective something very crucial in this time, because we, we got data already, already from uh, epidemiological data from COVID, like uh, incidents and death and so on. But contrasting this with the with this uh, social determinants and the role of innovation in the in the national responses is now the one key information we want to know more, because we know that the, at the breakdown there are risk groups, there are people lacking uh, access to healthcare, uh, healthcare is so inequalities are playing a, ma a major role. So I think this is gonna make um, a, a very interesting discussion after after our panelists from uh, Brazil expose their the cases. So as you said, Jordi, Brazil is the is one of the big giants of, of America, and uh, it's also a big giant in terms of COVID epidemics. Uh, because when you see the numbers, they are not so they are not as the United States without going close. They they are quickly going forward to two million cases. The numbers of death are really increasing, and the political scenario is quite uh, interesting too. So with us today, we have three experts in the, in the Brazil pandemics of COVID. And we're going to start, as you said, with uh, Dr. Jaila Diaz Borges. And uh, she's uh, coming from the University of uh, Amazonas. And she's going to present, make an overview of uh, the epidemic picture of COVID-19 in the state of Amazonas. And uh, some interesting points about testing a laboratory that are pretty in place there now. So thank you so very much, Dr. Jaila, for being with us today, and uh, it's up to you now. So thank you, thank you. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. I thank you for this kind of invitation. So in these next five minutes, I would like to give you an overview about the epidemiological uh, situation in Amazonas and share about uh, some testing that we are doing in the laboratory also. So next slide, please. Manaus is the capital of Amazonas and we have a, a, a very big population here. The half of the population of Amazonas state is in Manaus. And in Manaus, we, the, all the intensive care units from the state is in Manaus also. Uh, people in the interior, they don't have access for this. And also some cities, municipalities, they don't have a uh, hospital. And in this moment, the pandemic situation is in the interior, the problem. And people come to Manaus also. And in Manaus, we are in another moment of the pandemic. And we are going to discuss about this also. Next slide, please. Uh, this is this is like uh, it's just uh, uh, we can see the Brazil the new cases and the number of cases in the black line compared to some countries and we can see this it, the new cases in Brazil we are also increasing every day this is the data of the last week of last week yes next please. And yes, here there's the re, our region, and the Amazonas state is there in the north. And we, we can see we have the, in the last week, we have the decrease in the new cases and also deaths in our region. But each city is different, you know. I'm gonna talk about Manaus in the next slides. But the situation of the pandemic in interior is very different. 
So, uh, until now, this data is from, yes, from yesterday, the last data, uh, we have more than 8,000 confirmed cases in, in the state of Amazonas, and we have uh, about 3,000 deaths confirmed. Next, please. And this graphic, it's, uh, no, no, it's yeah, the next, please. This graphic is in Manaus. Our first case of COVID-19, it was in March 13. And in April and May, we had the peak. And some days we have more than 1,000 new cases of COVID-19. And from the last week, from June and July, we have about 300 cases. The, yesterday, we have more than 200 cases. But something very interesting in Manaus that if you come here today, you can see people are not worried about uh, COVID-19. You feel like so, pandemic is over. But I, I think this is not true because uh, now we have everything open, yeah? schools, bar, and uh, shopping mall. And we, I don't know what they are going to happen in the next one month after we see now traffic, we have a lot of people in the street. We also see people in, in depends on the area of the city, people, they don't use masks. So I, I'm very, it's a very big concern about this. Next slide, please. And Today we talked about uh, minority people and uh, in Amazonas we have indigenous population and we can see the situation, it's a, a, a very bad situation actually. In indigenous population living in village, uh, the data that we have from two days ago, yes, two days ago we have the, in a total of confirmed case 1,800 36 and of this we have 58 cases confirmed but this is only indigenous population uh, living in village if you see the all the indigenous population of the state also outside the village we have more than 4,000 cases confirmed and more than 100 cases of this also and there is one municipality uh, named São Gabriel da Cachoeira. The majority of the population there is indigenous population. And there we have the most of this among this population. Next, please. So I'm going to talk about some work that we are doing now. Since 14th of April, we started uh, together with the Health Surveillance Foundation of Amazonas, uh, FVS, né, que é a Fundação de Vigilância em Saúde do Estado do Amazonas, uh, together with the University of Amazonas, we are testing the, all the health professionals from Manaus. In April and May, uh, during the pandemic peak, some days we had more than 50% of the health professional uh, tested positive for COVID-19. In the prevalence in general, in that two months, it was 30%. But some days we had more than, for example, we had 300 health professional there and half of them was positive for, for COVID-19. And it, it, we had an impact on that uh, because these pro professionals, they couldn't work, but the most of them used to say, no, I have to work. I have to work. Even if I have uh, COVID-19, I have to work because we don't have enough team. And if I'm feeling better, I have to work. They, they, they couldn't understand that, that they cannot work because they could spread more. And we have this situation and more than sometimes half of the, these people 
tested positive for COVID-19. And also we had an expressive number of deaths in this group. Next slide, please. So, uh, this slide is just to, to see the, what we did. We made uh, ELISA and our antigen, it was the uh, N protein, nucleoclapsid protein. Next, please. And we, we had this uh, data in this uh, left. We have uh, the IgG. No, next, uh, sorry, I mean <laughs> in the next, yes, good. Thank you, George. And we have a cohort with PCR positive for COVID-19 and PCR negative. And our test worked very well. And we could also uh, take the patients with PCR negative because it was uh, more than seven days. And the IgG test in, in our ELISA in-house, it was uh, especially worked better after 10 days of the onset symptoms. And now in the right, next please. Yes, good. Uh, we have the data with IgA and also, we, we didn't use IgM. Our experience with IgM, it was not good because many patients, uh, even after the acute phase, the IgM stayed there for more than one month, sometimes four uh, days, and we couldn't differentiate. But IgA, we have uh, seen very nice um, data about this and also in our last data, we are seeing the, some connection, association about uh, the uh, IgA and the severity cases of COVID-19. So next, please. So here are, it's, it's our team. We can go for the next slide, please, just for finish. And there is another team that we invent, it was a box to sterilize a personal protective equipment, PPE. And we were, we are very worried about the, the garbage with masks. Yes, not only here, but in the whole world. And we had this idea and uh, this box is, next slide, please. We use UV uh, light and it was, the data are very good also because we could exterminate the bacteria, virus, and now we are looking for a private investment and transfer this technology for scale up and production. We are in this phase. So in general, the, the, this is our team also in, from the laboratory. And next slide, please. This is our team. And in general, what I would like to share uh, about what we are doing in the lab, there are these slides and this box. And this slide is in-house. We also are trying né, to get some uh, support to make this ELISA for more people in Amazon because uh, we can see that uh, testing is not enough for the population in general. So, thank you. Thank you so very much for this interesting uh, presentation, Jaila. It's impressive to see, first of all, uh, all this development you, you're doing in, in, in Amazonas, because um, for people who are not familiar with the, with the region, we will think that you may be uh, too remote, too isolated to, to develop things like this, but this is really impressive. And this project is really promising, I think, because you're developing um, lab tools for the local population, which will increase the, the, the quality of care, actually. And the second point we can retain, I mean, I retained from your presentation, was this vulnerability you talk about, about uh, with indigenous people. Because this is very special in Brazil. You and the Amazonas state are 
this state, like, you know, hosting uh, this, this population. I mean, they were the very the, the first uh, inhabitants from the, from the place. And it's really true that contrasting with uh, what uh, Jose and, and Rafael said in the United States with Latinos and, and, and African Americans, in Brazil, indigenous peoples are, are also vulnerable. So uh, maybe this will be, and not maybe, this, is, this would be also a point to our discussion, like vulnerabilities in terms of uh, COVID-19 uh, acquisition and uh, mobility. So thank you so, so very much. And then we move forward uh, now more down to the south in Brazil, to Sao Paulo state. Uh, we have today uh, Miss uh, Priscilla Cruzati. She's a nurse by train, but she's also an entrepreneur and she's CEO and founder from of, of FMC consulting firm, which is uh, a firm uh, assisting uh, public and private health sector into strengthening their, the quality of their care. So she's here today to, to talk about, to present us uh, what, what's the role of innovation uh, in the national COVID-19 response in Brazil. So I won't say more, I will let her tell us, take us to the to strip and uh, an innovation uh, field in Brazil. Thank you for being with us, Priscilla. It's up to you. You are muted, Priscilla. You need to. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so I'll provide uh, today a brief overview uh, of the challenges and innovations here in Brazil uh, to face COVID-19. Yes, wait a little bit for presentation. So next, this is uh, something where I studied, where I've been and working. So next, <laughs> let's move to the most important things. So here for the next five minutes, I will uh, talk a little bit about the healthcare sector in Brazil in order to move forward uh, and explain how we are dealing, uh, how we are facing COVID-19 here in Brazil and also uh, to the core of the presentation, uh, how innovations uh, are happening here. Uh, COVID, it's the same disease, but it, it has some characteristics, some difference between the countries. So next, please. Brazil is a very big country and very famous. Uh, we are big, we are uh, famous for football, uh, but some people have no idea what actually uh, is Brazil. So it's a, a, a huge country with over 200, a thousand, uh, over 200 million people and we have uh, 27 states. So uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to promote uh, care or to create programs for a country with uh, people in the countryside, with big cities like Sao Paulo, uh, only in Sao Paulo city, we have over 12 million people. Uh, so we have very, very, very big cities and other cities with 2,000 people. Uh, it's different. Uh, also, the, the social condition and everything is different. Uh, our life expectancy here is not too low, but not too high. It's on average uh, 76 years old. Uh, but this can depends a lot if you are poor or rich, if you are uh, men or, or women. Uh, and where do you live? Uh, we have uh, a very important thing here that's helping a lot us to struggle, at, not to struggle with COVID, uh, which is the universal public health care system, also known as SUS, Sistema Unico de Saúde. Uh, we are very famous for uh, our healthcare system, uh, especially because uh, it's universal. It's literally for everyone, no exceptions. If you are here in Brazil and if you face any kind of injuries, uh, you can uh, rely on SOS. Uh, this is peculiar for big countries. Usually uh, universal systems are for small countries. And uh, we have these for um, over 30 years. So uh, we are still uh, implementing some phases of the system. Uh, we have some highlights of the systems like the HIV program and the primary care uh, units. Uh, and the source, it's important to, uh, to explain that, uh, it has many functions. So this is, is in charge of regulation, sometimes it provides care, it's the payer, it's the inspector, and also manufactures vaccines and some medicines when necessary. Uh, 
so uh, its attrition is very uh, broad. And we have here in Brazil a variety of um, causes for mortality, and the top uh, five, uh, they are different. We have a chronic disease, but we also have a huge amount of homicides, and we, we have the uh, acute disease and tropical disease. Next. And I will conclude the, the healthcare panorama here. Although we have SUS, uh, which is public and universal, we have a private and very important healthcare system here in Brazil. 25% of the population have access to private care and they consume 60% of the uh, finance. So uh, they are the smaller portion of the population, but they use the biggest part of the, the money. And also uh, the, the uh, healthcare beds, it's like 50-50. Uh, half of the healthcare beds are in the uh, private sector. What means that usually like 7% of the time, uh, the, the public system pays for uh, private beds to offer for the patients, okay? So next. And now uh, we, we are facing COVID. Uh, what's COVID in Brazil? Uh, is, it is started here in Sao Paulo and, in February, and it did not come straight from China. It came from Italy. Uh, we had a Brazilian guy who was traveling there. He went for a carnival at Veneza, and he came uh, sick, uh, but he wasn't aware it was COVID. Uh, he was missing his family and he met all of them, more than 20 people um, in a weekend and infected a lot. And this was uh, at first here in Brazil, an elite and middle-class disease. Uh, right now we have over 68,000 deaths by COVID, uh, confirmed cases only here. Uh, we are the second uh, country uh, with uh, deaths. Uh, obviously because we are a big country, but not only because of that, uh, but I, I will leave this for another moment. Uh, but the, the social uh, determinants of disease that um, was mentioned earlier in the presentation, they apply a lot here in Brazil. So uh, at first it was an elite disease, but um, easily it changed. We started with a movement at stay home, if you can. So the elite can easily uh, perform home, home office, but the labor classes, they cannot. So they are exposed. And now this is more a labor class disease rather than an elite and middle class. Uh, the, the, the elite are more protected right now. And also this is started as a big city problem uh, for the past few months, for the past four months. It was intensely here in Sao Paulo, which is the biggest city in, uh, of Brazil, but also affected Manaus, which is a very important uh, and big city in the north. So the biggest city uh, was uh, were the most affected, but now we are changing. Uh, some uh, of these big cities like Sao Paulo, uh, uh, now we are facing a decrease and that's a number of cases, but the countryside are facing uh, increase and in new cases. So the problem is the countryside has less uh, hospitals, has less uh, infrastructure to offer, and we don't know yet how the city will um, respond to the COVID situation. Next. And we have social determinants for the disease, but also we have social determinants for uh, the innovations. So I, I classify the innovations that I'm uh, following up in two groups. We have a, a, a huge group of innovations focusing on prevent the collapse of the public healthcare system. Okay, uh, and we have another group focusing on help the private hospital and also the private uh, physicians in maintain uh, its revenues. It's not to increase uh, because they are facing a uh, loss of patients. Uh, they are not performing surgeries. Uh, I will talk a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, they are facing problems and they need to sustain their, themselves. They have bills to pay and whatever. So uh, we have just two uh, different kinds of innovations. Next. 
So uh, for the public system, uh, we have scarce resources and it's a problem with the infrastructure, infrastructure and how to balance this with the high demand. So 75% of the people rely on schools, they rely on the public system, and also the disease is now more common in the labor class. These uh, push uh, the, the public uh, to look for infrastructure, so we have, and also to supplies. So the solutions are looking for money. Uh, we have a lot of crowdfunding, a lot of donations being organized. Uh, organized. Uh, we have low-cost diagnostic solutions uh, being developed, uh, like not only uh, laboratories, uh, but also uh, for image, so if artificial intelligence, APPs to help the doctors uh, to have like a second opinion or, or and to faster analyze an, an X-ray or a tomography. Uh, uh, we have some logistics uh, helping, so in, um, like bus and containers with hospital supplies, uh, clinics uh, moving into the cities and equipment moving to the cities. We also uh, are using a lot of 3D printing to have supply, to have face shields, to have uh, things to help uh, protect the, the, the staff who are in the front line. Uh, we have uh, mechanical respirators being developed right now in Brazil. We usually have this coming from China, uh, but there, there's not enough in the world for every country who's facing COVID. So the, 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 the main characteristics, the common characteristics here for the solution, it's not only making uh, resources available, but also pivoting things that were already working uh, to help COVID. So we have, uh, it's not necessarily that something developed for COVID. They were pivoted to help to uh, face COVID, okay? Next. And this was important to have a fast reply and, and to answer so fast the COVID situation. Next, please. I will, ah, here. I will talk a little bit about the priority. Sorry, I, I said. Uh, uh, so the, the challenge in the private care, uh, it's that, People, the patients, they are avoiding elective uh, procedures. And here in Brazil, we have the pay, uh, the fee for service model. So people are delaying uh, elective procedures, and the hospitals and physicians, they uh, they are facing problems uh, with the money and the pay. They have decreasing revenues. They have uh, right now uh, we have in the solution uh, something, but until the uh, the COVID. Telemedicine in Brazil was forbidden. We had no regulation and also it was forbidden. And right now, uh, it is a solution. Uh, we, in the private care, mainly the solutions are telemedicine, robots, 3D printing, and their diversification and partnerships. So hospital uh, laboratories, for example, they are not only providing exams, but they are also uh, launching APPs uh, for telemedicine for the physicians to use their platform and if the physicians would uh, use a laboratory platform for uh, uh, an appointment, probably they will uh, request the exams and, and everything at that laboratory. So they are trying to engage patients uh, even though they are laboratories and they do not perform appointments, uh, medical appointments, they are providing solutions for physicians in order to engage patients. Uh, they are kind of uh, desperate, it's a, a desperate situation. Uh, and an important thing here is, although now it's okay to do telemedicine, we have no regulation. So people are trying, uh, many solutions are uh, being launched, uh, especially in mental health because it's another problem uh, during COVID. We not only have the problem of people avoiding going to anywhere, uh, if not necessary, but people are struggling with their mental health. We are, who, who, who can in many cities are locked down, are, are locked at home for four months, uh, interacting too little with their family. So uh, mental health, health is a problem and telemedicine can help a lot with that. 
but telemedicine has uh, some problems with uh, other kind of conditions where you can you need actually to see and to perform some examinations in the patient so next uh, that was my overview. I'll keep everything else for the discussion. Mm -hmm. But just to remind you, we have a big country facing a new disease with social conditions, not only for the disease, but for the innovations. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Priscilla, for this presentation. It was uh, very interesting, actually, because uh, we can see now a trend in our, in our session today. Um, there is innovation with one word, and there is also inequalities in another word. We bring again the subject of uh, uh, social determinants into uh, like like a, like a major major variable in the, in the equation of this, in the COVID response. Uh, so uh, we see like like you present us to today like the difference between both system, the public and the private system, and we see that both uh, they were both engaged into the response, but both were facing different challenges. Which, is, which are going to be part also, an important part of our discussion today. Because uh, usually we talk about like universal care, but in countries like Brazil or the United States, uh, this, the healthcare system is different. It works different than in Europe and somewhere else. So maybe these aspects also uh, shape the, 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 the response of, the, of COVID-19 in these countries. So thank you so very much. And now we move forward to uh, Dr. Israel Molina. He's a medical doctor, clinician. Uh, he's now in the state of Minas Gerais, just next to Sao Paulo, more than the southeast again. And he's leading sounding research and uh, clinical research uh, in, in COVID-19. And he's, uh, he brought us today, uh, he presented us today, uh, what are the, 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 the new things coming up in research in the, in the, in the COVID response <laughs> in, in Brazil. So thank you for being with us today, uh, Dr. Molina, and it's up to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be with you and to share my experience with you. Well, the thing is that that my situation is quite is quite, I mean, funny because I came here in Brazil. I arrived to Brazil more or less in February, <laughs> just a few weeks before the, the pandemics, and I arrived here with a project, with the idea, with the aim to to set a clinical setting for tropical disease um, research. I'm a clinician and I have some kind of expertise in running clinical trials in tropical diseases. And before I can start to do something, the, the, the COVID arrived here and I have to move to the research on COVID. Um, what is a little bit different uh, as my previous uh, colleagues talk in Brazil, I don't know why, I don't know why which is the reason, but Minas Gerais is one of the states less affected with coronavirus than compared with other states in, in Brazil. I don't know why, I don't have any, any explanation. I live in, in Belo Horizonte, uh, it's the capital city of Minas Gerais, and the state, in the overall point of view, they have the lowest, one of the lowest ratios of, of incidence of the infection in the country. I don't know. I don't know if it's the cachaça it's a, or, or, or I don't know which, which is the, the reason, but probably it's because it's one of the less connected states in Minas Gerais. I mean, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, or even Manaus, they have a very powerful international hub uh, or international flight connection with, with another part of the, of, the, of the world. And our international airport it's not so so important. I don't know if it's that or if there's another reason. For example, in Horizonte, uh, the major of the city, they start a very tough isolation policy uh, fourth mo four months ago. What it means that I'm close at home uh, since more or less I arrived to Brazil. It's not been a good experience for me at all. And well, I arrive here, I, 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 I have a, a certain expertise in clinical trials and I've decided to, to, to design uh, two clinical trials. The first one uh, it was designed four months ago, it was designed in order to protect the healthcare workers. And we designed uh, one of the two major clinical trials that are running nowadays uh, against coronavirus. It's a, a prophylaxis uh, pre-exposition against coronavirus, coronavirus using chloroquine. Um, 
to to use chloroquine in Brazil, it has been a very tough issue because I don't know if you are following the news, but chloroquine it has been connected with with some political uh, parts of the country, and it's not been so easy to implement that clinical trial, but but we are still pushing to, to, to run clinical trial. We are still fighting to conduct the, the study. Uh, and, it's, and it's going on, it's going on. Uh, it's about to 1,000 people enroll, uh, not yet, but it's, it's, a, it's a provision that to, to enroll for about 1,000 participants. And what we want to assess is the, 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 the protective effect of chloroquine. There have been there are also many other clinical trials that they have been finished or not even published that they have been assessing not the use of chloroquine as a treatment that probably it has demonstrated that it's not effective, but many other clinical trials they've been assessing the chloroquine as a post exposure prophylaxis. It seems that as a post exposure prophylaxis, it's also not working at all, but for now to date. We have zero evidence of chloroquine or any other drug as a pre exposure. Uh, with all the data we have nowadays in, in in vitro or in vivo models, probably the most efficient strategy to use chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine would be uh, as a pre exposure, not as a post exposure or even as a treatment. In parallel, what we're also doing is from all the participants that who are going to be infected in our clinical trials, we are going to design a cohort of healthcare, work, healthcare workers infected. And we want to accompany them for at least two years because also what we want to, to evaluate or what we want to assess is the risk of reinfection. Um, we still don't know. We still don't know how protective are the antibodies against coronavirus, and that's why we wanted to to identify a cohort, uh, a, a cohort that is going to be very interesting because they are healthcare workers. I mean, it's not general population. What it means that they are a population more motivated than the health than the, the general population, and we want to to accompany them, we have to follow up them for about two years. And we want, we will assess the risk of infection and also we, we are going to assess uh, the, 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 the effect or, or, or the powerful or the, or, the, or the activity of the antibodies in order to, to control or to, or to avoid new infections. These more or less are the two clinical trials that we are involved from our institution in collaboration with a public network of hospitals in, in Berizonte. And, and let's see what's, what's going to, to happen. Uh, as a European here in, in, in Brazil, probably I have another point of view or, or some, some another uh, expectatives. For example, I've been for me, one of the things that it's it's more shocking. Uh, I, I've conducted clinical trials in Europe, in other Latin America countries, or even in Africa. Brazil probably is one of the more complicated countries to conduct a clinical trial because because of the, <laughs> they have a very impressive bureaucracy. I mean, it's it's a nightmare. But uh, probably people living in Brazil <laughs> they agree with me, but. For a European trying to do something in Brazil, it's really a challenge uh, because they have a very strong and very tough bureaucracy. But at least in fourth month period, we have started the clinical trial. We have gathered the money, gathered the fundings, and, and we are finally a start. I prefer to stop here, and if you have more, more questions, I will be happy to, to answer you. Thank you so very much, Israel, uh, for bringing this subject again to the to, to, to the panel. Because uh, HCQ have been have been I mean had hydroxychloroquine has been one of the names that most commonly found in the in the COVID nineteen discussion for the controversy in terms of research, in terms of outcomes, in terms of results, in 
everywhere. So you still think that uh, we can count, I mean, it can, it can work somehow to, 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 to fight back the COVID-19. Maybe not as a treatment, but maybe as a prophylaxis, as you said, and a very specific population, which is uh, the healthcare workers. So this is very promising. I think this is, uh, uh, the, the, we completed the, this, the, the cycle with Brazil, and we can then go forward with the discussion because uh, I think, I'm sure, uh, uh, there are many questions uh, now uh, on the open just to, ready to be fired. Because uh, we talk about several key points here that are very, very interesting, starting by inequalities that everyone here talk about a little bit. Of. And then uh, all the approach of innovation, the, the, the role of, 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 of all, how COVID-19 response pushed the, the, the innovation field. Uh, uh, in, in medicine, taking us to another level. So maybe, Jordi, you have already some questions yes. there, right? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Sorry, everybody. Then. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you, to the Rafael, Pietro, about the American situation, and Israel, Jail, and Priscilla. It, I, I promise you to cut you after five minutes, but uh, we couldn't because it was quite interesting and it was Very deserved to explain, right, right. to explain, to explain, to explain. This, in this huge, uh, two big giants. Uh, so we apologize for the audience that is listening. But now let's enjoy, as always, with this debate. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, shot two right, two straightforward questions to everybody. No, the first one: um, How you all in your respective countries are you? How think? How do you believe that people are managing this schizophrenic? messages from the top political level, no? Uh, in comparison with more debased evidence messages from the doctors or the people from municipalities. How do we believe people are leaving that? That's the first question. And the second question to all of you is like, um, as Pietro was saying in the States, as Priscilla was saying in Brazil or even uh, Israel. Israel came to Brazil to war with Chagas disease, no? So how all this, how all this uh, COVID pandemic will affect uh, indirectly or directly the other chronic disease uh, the, in that sense? No, so please, uh, Pietro or Rafael, start, start yourself if you want, answering one of the two questions. Rafa. The first Rafa? question is... Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, please, yeah. go ahead. We, we don't hear you. We don't hear you now. Okay. Ahora? Ahora? Si? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'll start with the second question because the first question is very political and I, I think I better... Yeah. You know, my but, but I think... That, <laughs> Wonderful. I think the uh, the uh, the second question. I, I think that uh, the 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 pandemic has uh, had and will have even more so a tremendous negative impact in uh, chronic diseases. It, it, it even had impact in acute diseases. You know, um, half of what I do is acute surgical care, emergency care, and we saw for two or three weeks minimal uh, emergencies, uh, surgical emergencies, which which have nothing to do with people's will. That, that just happens because it happens, right? And uh, But I think that in regards to uh, to the chronic diseases, I think that uh, the, 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 the patient and the system is uh, slowing down things to a dangerous level. And uh, we, for example, are are uh, 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 very much doing elective surgery, uh, but very slowly. And we only started a few weeks ago, right? Uh, we stopped elective surgery. And uh, if you think about oncologic diseases, if you think about, you know, uh, uh, invasive cardiologic, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 evaluations or treatments, uh, the line between acute and chronic is very wide and it's gray and it fades. So uh, uh, the impact that we are are having uh, because of the thought that, uh, being all focused on, 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 on the pandemic, and it has to be, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been a problem and it will be more of a problem if we don't think uh, uh, in a different way. I think that we need to, to learn how to cope 
and, and tackle the, the pandemic, but at the same time, we cannot forget that healthcare continues and uh, that there are many other diseases and that many of those other chronic diseases affect the, the, the outcome of COVID-19 disease. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll cut it short here, but that's my general thought. So don't feel, thank you, thank you, Rafa. Don't feel the first question as a political one. I would say we don't want to talk about politics and epidemics. You're right, you're right, uh, Rafael. But it's just a question of how people can be affected, not about these different messages, no? not a clear message in that sense. No? But thank you, Rafa, thank you in that sense. Yeah. Uh, Pietro, or whoever. Uh, very quickly, uh, just to follow up on what Rafael is saying regarding chronic uh, diseases and misinformation, there is um, a lot of information out there and not all the information is accurate. Just, you know, what Rafa started saying about masks. Um, so, you know, a lot of people don't want to wear masks anymore uh, because, uh, you know, what, what they're hearing on the, um, the social media. Um, so, that, so, so, um, so that's an issue. And uh, with chronic diseases, uh, so people, uh, when, you know, when we were in the middle of the, when we had a lot, 6,000 cases daily in New York, so obviously people did not want to go to hospitals because hospitals also were keeping people away if it was not related to, uh, to the pandemic. But what's happening now is that people are afraid uh, to go back to hospitals uh, uh, or to even you know private clinics or small or small clinics or small health centers, uh, because there's a, still a lot of fear uh, that they are going to be uh, infected uh, by the virus. Um, so um, chronic people with chronic diseases they need regular uh, evaluations, regular testing to make sure that they're doing okay or to address any issue, and that's not happening as you know we would like to because people are just afraid uh, to go. So some are saying that uh, when we look at the data, probably later we will see that the uh, more uh, complications and probably mortality uh, will be higher uh, just because people are not, you know, following the routine checkup. So that's what they are are saying that uh, we would probably look that at the data and probably will be more complications of that that are happening with COVID nineteen. But we don't have the hard data for that. But that's what they're um, that's what they you know they they are saying. And you hear on the television or radio, uh, hospitals and clinics they keep saying. Um, we are following all the recommendations by CDC, by the public health department. It is safe for you to come and for your checkup. It is safe for you to come and visit you, visit us, uh, because they're having a, a, a hard, uh, hard time to get in those patients that need care. Uh, people just don't want to go. Um, regarding uh, mental health, uh, that's obviously you know an issue. Uh, the rates of anxiety, depression has increased, and, and connected to that, we also see an increase of domestic violence uh, quite significantly uh, uh, all over the U.S. and as I understand, all over the world um, too. Um, interesting, um, with the, uh, the behavioral health services that I'm connected with, we have seen um, an increase of telemedicine. As Rafael mentioned before, uh, there was a lot of uh, obstacles to use telemedicine, and all of a sudden, we all use in telemedicine. So, uh, with the services I'm connected with, we um, before they were struggling to have the patients to come and be seen. Uh, <laughs> as soon as they started with telemedicine, they, they, their productivity is skyrocketing, and uh, people are really taking advantage of that. Uh, they were saying older people will not be able to use it. Uh, they won't. Will, they will not use it. People who have no access to funds. Uh, but actually, uh, there has been a, a significant increase in use in um, uh, telemedicine. Uh, but just going back to to the question of behavioral health services, uh, it, it is an issue. It has increased uh, just because of what's going on. Uh, but I think at least the experience I have in New York, uh, telemedicine has really become very handy uh, for mental health patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pietro. Uh, from the Brazilian side, uh, congratulations, Jaila, for all your innovative work no? with the, with the um, innovation that you mentioned, the test, the test ELISA, uh, the box, no? the, 
the, box, the kiss box that you were describing with the UV. Um, do you want to comment also in this, in this, the initial questions about the different messages about the chronic disease or anything related also with your innovations? So uh, in, in, in Amazonas, for, uh, talking about this, this first question, we can see a big problem with this message that comes from the professional and comes from the government. Difficult to manage this, especially also that uh, a lot of message by WhatsApp and people, they believe everything they read, they, be, they believe. And also in our state today, people don't care about the use mask. And if you, if the government, they, they say, no, it's not necessary, of course, the most of them will not use. Or if the government, uh, they don't give the example, in people in general, also they will not follow what the profi health professional, they are saying. It's a, a very big problem, definitely. And about the consequences, that's true. Uh, here in Amazonas, we had uh, always the new talking about people with cancer. They, they, they were not going to the hospital to check, you know, the routine. And we had very big problem with that also. And nowadays, everything is coming, yes, and the situation is different. But during the peak, the pandemic peak, People, they use it not to go to check. And we also had the increase in the cancer deaths also because of that. And another situation like um, uh, domestic violence against women and also children. We had this problem here. And now uh, we are checking about this and we have also to see the way how to, to change this, you know. But we are facing this kind of problem in the Amazonas also. And Thank you very much. I would, I would like to say very, very fast is uh, all this data that we, we sh I share today is some, we, we don't believe that data uh, because we have this data that people that could get access to health system. For example, about indigenous population. Uh, we we see this we saw this video they are saying no oh, uh, uh, they they make this difference you know if they don't go to the health system how will you know that this number the correct number of indigenous population affected with covid-19 we don't know so that's it thank thank you jaila for being so honest and data is important and in that case, uh, you say that you don't believe in the real world data because it's not enough data, uh, as you were mentioning. No, we hope that technology and innovation can help and we can have this uh, crisis as a trigger point, no? Any comments, Israel, about the chronic issues, uh, Priscilla, about innovations? What do you think, Israel? Well, uh, to to add new new aspects from what has been said for example i'm i'm i i, I used to, to to deal with neglected tropical diseases that it means that that diseases that currently they don't give any attention like chagas disease like leishmania so uh, schistosomiasis that kind of diseases one of the things is that is going to happen in the future is that uh, if those diseases, uh, they don't have been attended since now, now with the coronavirus, uh, all the fundings that they were compromised, committed with that kind of disease, they are going to disappear. Because, I mean, it's going to be really difficult to find any fund to do research or to treat that kind of diseases because, I mean, all the fundings everywhere have been used to defeat the coronavirus. Another point of view, another another aspect is that for one of the very first moments in history, that virus, that disease, it's, it's been so democratic. I mean, it, mean, it means that it has been affected all the stages of the society, the rich, the poor. Uh, it, it has been very democratic. That means that they have put in evidence uh, more in, uh, inequalities in healthcare, as has been said before. And for example, in many regions of the world, like for example, Africa, 
probably the isolation or the, or the, or the isolation strategies that has been uh, imposed by Europe or by WHO is going to be more impact than the proper and the than, than the coronavirus because I mean it's quite easy to make isolation in my situation that I have a salary I have a, a, an apartment I live alone but for example uh, talking with my, my my colleagues that works in Angola uh, all hospitals that they have uh, admitted patients like for example with tuberculosis they have transfer at home all patients because they were with the fear to be infected with coronavirus. And, and probably in the future, uh, the impact of not treating those patients with tuberculosis, with HIV, with those chronically infectious diseases, it's going to be a, a, an explosion of health indicators in 2021. I, I've talked about, about chronic infectious disease but for example, those families that they need to work every day to earn the just money to buy food for the same day, it's going also to have a very big impact with the desnutrition in, in probably in children in Africa, but also in Brazil, because one of the things that I have had the opportunity to see here is that the, the, the difference in, in, in social it has been more, more prone here in Brazil than, than probably in, in, in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Israel. Um, I, I, I want to, to start the finishing part of the program. Thank you very much, everybody, for also giving the word to Juan Antonio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Priscilla, yeah, go, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, quick data uh, for your questions. The first one is about Bolsonaro or any kind of government. They have uh, two things. First, as a government, they are in charge of providing support. Uh, so, uh, just uh, the data is we had two ministers of health fired this year during the pandemic, and right now we don't have uh, a minister of health. This is the data uh, for support of the, the of the federal government. The second part of a president uh, role is uh, he's a public figure, and whatever he states influences people. Uh, uh, so uh, there is a study uh, from USP, Federal WC, and Getulio Vargas Foundation uh, about uh, Bolsonaro's rhetoric against isolation, and it states that may have killed his voters more. Uh, so his uh, rhetoric has impacted uh, because people are, are, who are aligned with him is not wearing masks or keeping isolation. Uh, that's an, an in, it's sad, but it's an interesting fact that is being already uh, studied. Okay, and the second point uh, about chronic disease, I will change it a little bit for acute disease. So here in Brazil, as I explained, we have the SUS, we have our universal health system and we vaccinate people for free uh, and we vaccinate them against the flu uh, usually we have a great coverage of vaccinations uh, we don't have a lot of people against it uh, it's not a big issue here in brazil okay but this year uh we are in, in winter and so we started vaccinating people for the flu uh and right now we have only 60% of the uh, priority groups vaccinated. The Ministry of Health uh, expanded, they uh, postponed for another month in order to try to reach the target. But even for the flu, which is uh, even for vaccine, which was a, a very common thing, people were used to take the shot, uh, they are staying home and avoiding to go. So that's my data. Uh, uh, Thank like you. Th thank you, thank, thank you, you, Priscilla. Thank you. you have you have you have made uh, change my mind a little bit. We didn't want to talk about politics, but I will I will leave as a, as a, we will leave as a, with a comment, no? a reflection, a reflection before yeah, giving us the yeah, word to, to Juan. Juan. Um, there is enough data to say that the countries that have uh, uh, a female leadership, a female leadership, no, have have done better with with the numbers no we have uh, good numbers in new zealand we have good numbers we have good numbers in in germany we have good numbers in another series of countries led by 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 women but of course there is also many structural uh, things but also in the countries that have 
a more public health uh, institution, more public um, public spending, no um, institutions spending public money in in the healthcare have done better than systems that are more private, pro-private uh, oriented. Um, in the context that there is more inequality, of course, the virus, like in the case of, of, of Brazil uh, and the United States, has reached maybe uh, a huge a huge peak. No, this is a real data. We could have a huge program about uh, talking about that. In any case, I would like to to congratulate, uh, as always, Rafael, uh, starting by Rafael. Uh, he's a, a doctor on um, frontline, always engaged with this type of programs, not only in innovation in digital health, but also in these trammers as well. Uh, we congratulate you, Rafa, as always. Uh, uh, Priscilla, thank you for being so combative and, and congratulations for your innovation, being an arts and innovative. Jaila, thank you very much for having accepted the invitation and, and congratulations for the work in, in, the, in the heart of Amazon. Uh, for us, and it's, it's great. Uh, Pietro, uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for being always interested in public health and, and being with us um, and, and giving us this broad scope of, of minorities. Uh, Israel, uh, thank you very much because, as you say, you came to Brazil to take care of chronic, di uh, this neglected chronic disease like Chagas, and you are now uh, implementing in this. Um, in, more than difficult, no a bureaucracy. Not only Brazil, there are many countries in the world. No, let's 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 support that. But thank you very much, Juan. What would you like to add before leaving? I will just add one thing. Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, you know, I retain uh, two or three keywords from the presentation of today. And one of them is disruption, as innovation came up as a savior of the health system. First of all. Second of all, minorities. It came up several times today, not only today in our session of, of today, but uh, all across all the other sessions too. And uh, I think, and I cannot avoid to think about 40 years ago, we had another epidemic that came up and changed the world, changed the health system, which was HIV. And this is kind of happening with the COVID too, because it just reflects what's happening with the health system today and what needs to be changed. And it's forcing the change because we were maybe not as fast or as proactive as we should be before. And now it's showing us, pointing out like clearly where we have to go, where we have to move forward. And this is the real interesting part of it. Maybe for, for next sessions, we're gonna start seeing more common things, more breakdowns, more data breakdowns, which show more in detail what are the next key action points. So this is somehow why we do this kind of things because all these uh, uh, experts bring from their perspective all these uh, uh, very interesting points that we put it together and you get uh, this uh, impressive uh, and, and, and up-to-date concept of proof of concept of the direction we, we have to go. So thank you all very much for the time, for the disponibility and the motivation to come here today and bring us all this information that we, uh, we will share, I mean, we're sharing today with, uh, with our, our viewers. Thank you so very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for allowing us to start talking about the giants. We're going to talk about the states more often, and we're going to talk about Brazil. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you soon in the new chapters. We're going to talk very soon. Hey, Rafa, final <laughs> word. Say something, Rafa. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to talk soon. In new chapters, we're going to talk soon in new chapters about Spain, France, and Italy, this triangle of South Europe that has reached uh, the maximum peak of deaths because of the senior population. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about very soon, very soon, about innovation in primary care and how can primary care be the wall to stop this pandemic. Thank you very much. See you soon to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.